Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. This is Bishop Brian Willett of the Holy Nicolaian Catholic Church coming to you live from the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains on this March 1st, 2016. Today, we talk about culpability and sin. Continuing from our thought two weeks ago, I apologize for not being available last week. I'm just getting over a terrible case of laryngitis. And that uh, has pretty much taken away my voice. It, it's just now starting to come back, but it's not 100%. So I ask you to bear with me and be patient with me through this time. But I'm going to try to give you the best show that I possibly can. And I also have some very good news to report today. Exceptionally good news for us. Stay tuned. It's going to be a good one. Welcome back, everyone. And uh, once again, this is Bishop Brian Willett thanking you for uh, joining me this afternoon uh, if you're on the East Coast. We're going to be talking about culpability and sin here in a minute, but I uh, have a few things that I want to address with you first. And uh, it's a really wonderful news for us. Wonderful news, something that we've been working on for so long and have finally achieved. I can finally report it to all of you. It just so happened to come in just an hour before this broadcast, so it's a great day for a broadcast. Great day to uh, uh, be able to share with the public who lifts, listens to the show loyally um, that we are now 100% determined by the Internal Revenue Service and the subsequently the United States government to be a official 501c3 federally tax-exempt church. That's correct. We are now 100% federally tax-exempt. We are an official 501c3, which means all donations that uh, you uh, support us with. Uh, going back to February 12, 2012, when the uh, legal corporation of the Holy Nicolaian Catholic Church was formed, are tax exempt. So now any donations that uh, you give to us, any support that you pledge to us to assist us in keeping the show going and helping us with our exorcism ministry, helping us with our uh, mystical teaching ministry, as well as our uh, sacramental ministry here in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, is now tax exempt. So all you have to do if you wish to support us further uh, is uh, when you give us a donation, I can uh, now issue you a receipt that indicates that you officially gave to this 501c3 charity, and you can now use that to deduct on your taxes, which is a great way of giving back to all of you who have supported us prior to our receiving that. So this is really wonderful news, and I, and I can't really stress it enough. Um, how important it is for a church to be recognized by the government, particularly in this day and age. Um, and, you know, nobody really wants to donate to charities that are not official 501c3s, but we are. And this gives us other benefits, uh, discounts when we need to rent a location for a large seminar or something like that. Um, really, really, really effective uh, tool for uh, ministry these days in the United States of America. So um, once again... 
We constantly need your support. There's never enough money to do everything that the, this ministry does. Now we are 501c3, so please consider us. If you are a charitable person, uh, if you uh, like to donate to charities, please remember us uh, because we definitely need your support. We're growing, and we're growing bigger every day, but there's so much that we cannot do because we just do not have the financial resources to do everything that is asked of us or expected of us. It's very difficult. We've got priests in other countries trying to incarnate over. We have seminarians in other countries that need support and we need to bring them over. Um, and we have so many people in the Atlanta, Georgia area that need our support and we just do not have the time or resources to be able to effectively reach each and every one of them. And this is especially true with our exorcism ministry. I cannot stress to you how um, prolific spiritual problems are. So our spiritual problem resolution ministry, which is our official name for it, uh, needs your support so that we can expand it and reach more people and more efficiently and effectively resolve their problems. So I thank you all. If you do give to us, if you remember us, if you make the Holy Nicolaian Catholic Church your one of your charities that you give to, hopefully on a regular basis, because we definitely need a continual um, support system for all of the work that we do, I can't thank you enough. So please remember us uh, in your charitable work. Okay, so today let's talk about culpability and sin. This is really sort of a part two to the last episode that we had. And, um, you know, this is an important uh, message because I didn't really have time. I ran out of time last time uh, when we were talking about uh, sin in the conventional context of ordinary, the way the, the conventional large canonical churches typically reference sin. And if, just to refresh your memory, you know, in the West, it's mostly seen as or described as missing the mark. God sets before us a mark, uh, an expectation to follow that is a reflection of holiness so that we can make ourselves compatible with his nature as much as is possible to a fallen uh, being as the human race is. And any time we miss that expectation that's missing the mark, that is falling into a state of sin. And we've talked a great deal about the differences between mortal sin and venial sin and the different classifications of sin. But now we're going to talk about the esoteric side. And the esoteric side is an important, if not more so, a, a more important understanding that uh, conventional churches just don't want to talk about because it's uh, not an area that they wish to go. And it's unfortunate because understanding the esoteric side of sin gives us, or I should say empowers us, to defeat sin in our lives. To rise above it. And to reach that stage of holiness that we are all called to become. In Buddhism, and you'll see when I talk about the esoteric side of things, we refer to Buddhism quite frequently. Um, in Buddhism, there really is no sin, because really God, or a divine being, or a divine intelligence, is not actually the focus of Buddhism. And that works sometimes to its spiritual detriment. But it also can work to its advantage. And this is one of the ways that it does. There's only one thing that can be considered a sin in Buddhism. Only one. And they've got moral rules and obligations, but these are not the things that condemn one. There's only one thing that is truly damning in Buddhism. And that is ignorance. Ignorance is really the only sin that you can commit in Buddhism. 
Subsequently, looking at it from the Christian perspective, as we should as Christians, the word sin, while it has a different connotation and definition in the conventional church structure, in the way you know the historical theology has looked at it, is, for our purposes, synonymous with ignorance. And this is where culpability becomes important. Because in order to commit sin, and I think we talked about this last time, in order to commit sin, it has to be a willful action. In other, in other words, to be culpable for it. Now, we all commit sin, whether we're aware of it or not. And that was what the, the focus of the last episode was, that You know, we are dealing with something that we've classified as institutionalized sin. And that is the nature of us to just be in a fallen world, having to make decisions. I mean, think about, you know, a good example is lying. Can we always tell the truth? We are commanded by the Ten Commandments to never never bear false witness against our neighbor. And yet, if we were to be completely honest in every scenario, in every situation in life, would we be able to function never telling even a white lie? All lies are sin, but there are some times where withholding information is essential. Sometimes it is the lesser of two evils. And so therefore our culpability based upon our intent must be assessed. That's part of what is understood to be the judgment of God. And I want to make that extremely clear. If, I, if you take nothing else away from this uh, episode today, I want you to keep in mind that the judgment of God is not the judgment of a judge, like in reference to the legal system. I mean, what do you think of when you think of a judge? You think of somebody who determines your fate legally and has the authority to do it. And so when we place that type of perception into God, it really distorts what the judgment of God is. The judgment of God is not a condemning judgment. It is not a judgment where we are assessed whether or not we're going to heaven or hell, and he makes the decision. Absolutely not. Purge all of that from your mind. That is erroneous, and it is harmful to your own spirituality and the spirituality of others. What must be remembered about God's judgment is it's an assessing process for your viability to maintain cohesion within the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven is pure holiness and nothing that is even less than holy can enter into it. Not because God doesn't want you there, Not because you're too evil and he's sending you to hell because of it. Not because you're not worthy. None of us are worthy. Jesus came down from heaven and became man for our sake because he knew we were not capable of achieving to this on our own, by our own merits. That's the whole point of the sacrifice of the cross. So it's not about that. What it is, though, is about your compatibility to access the kingdom. Nothing unholy can enter into it. And so therefore, we must be made holy in order to become compatible with that reality. We, at the present time, are not compatible with that reality, which is why, even though the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and it exists all around us, it's not up there in the sky, contrary to popular notions and, you know, metaphors that people start to take literally. No, 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 no. Contrary to these popular beliefs, the kingdom of heaven exists all around you. It is a condition, not a place. Just like hell is a condition, not a place. What would make us incompatible with holiness? Well, that is what we call sin. It damages our relationship to God, which is the only thing that matters. Not the Bible, not religion. These things are there to assist us with developing that relationship. 
But the thing that is the most important is the relationship with God. Do not make an idol of the Bible. Do not make an idol of religion or your religion or your chosen practice. People do. The evangelical crowd worships the Bible. They don't understand God at all. Not that I've seen. There are a few. There are a few evangelicals that are somewhat rational. But the larger evangelical movement, all I see is is Bible idolatry. The Bible has become their tarot deck. And they use it as such. They miss the relationship with God and they have developed a relationship with their notions in their memorizations of the Bible. This is idolatry. It is sin. It separates and damages us from... It, dam- it separates us from God and damages the relationship, which is directly contrary to their purpose. It's a bastardization of the truth. And it is all because of ignorance. Every sin, every sin we commit is the result of ignorance. How can we really ever willfully make any decision when we are bound by human emotions which are derivatives from an animal nature? Let's not forget that we are primates. And I know there's going to be some Christians out there that you know reject evolution and think that the world is only 4,000 or 6,000 years old or whatever. Um, no. No. Evolution is not in contrary to the teachings of the church. We do not understand the ways of God, and remember the Bible is largely metaphor. Our lives are largely metaphor. It is ignorance that separates us from God. It is ignorance that damages that relationship. It is ignorance that prevents us from being able to cultivate the type of relationship that we are called to cultivate. Because we, need, we do not know what we are doing. Jesus says this from the cross, and that's very important. That very moment when he is saving us from ourselves, forgive them, Father, they do not know what they do. Ignorance. That's what needs to be snuffed out. That's why Buddhists, that's what nirvana is in Buddhism. It's the extinguishing. Nirvana means extinguishing. What are we extinguishing? We're extinguishing ignorance and thus suffering. And sin definitely leads us to suffer. Anything that deprives us of the the joys of being united with God is truly suffering. We are told that death is the consequences of sin where say that the punishment for sin is death, but it's really the consequence. God did not bring death into the world as a punishment for Adam and Eve's original infraction against his law. No, that's not correct theology. Death is the natural consequence to disobeying God. Because when you disobey God, you break the relationship. When you break the relationship, you cut off your vitality. In the Nicene Creed, it says, it it refers to the Holy Spirit as the giver of life. All living things contain the essence of the Holy Spirit. And as you sin, you damage it. You push it out. If you do enough sin, if you commit enough sin if you continually engage in a state of ignorance, then eventually there's no room left for the Holy Spirit and you die. It's just the consequence of it. It's not a punishment. It's not because you're unworthy. It's simply because you refuse to cultivate the living, breathing Holy Spirit that exists within you, that has given you life. And that will that will be it. Now, I want to take a moment here to further this esoteric thought by reflecting on the reading from this past Sunday uh, at uh, the liturgical calendar, the third Sunday of Lent, which was on February 28th. And 
The lectionary for that day uh, gave us the reading of Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. And I want to read a little bit about that for you, okay? So this is Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. Some people told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with the blood of their sacrifices. Jesus said to them in reply, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were greater sinners than all other Galileans? By no means. But I tell you, if you do not repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 people who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them? Do you think they were more guilty than everyone else who lived in Jerusalem? By no means. But I tell you, if you do not repent, they will, you will all perish as they did. And he told them this parable. There, was once, there once was a person who had a fig tree planted in his orchard. And when he came in search of fruit on it, but found none, he said to the gardener, For three years now I have come in search of fruit on this fig tree, but have found none. So cut it down. Why should it exhaust the soil? He said to him in reply, Sir, leave it for this year also, and I shall cultivate the ground around it and fertilize it. There may be a fruit in the future. If not, you can cut it down. Now, for those of you who attended my Mass this past uh, uh, Sunday, you've already heard a little bit about what I'm going to say here in my homily, but I think it's important to all of you who are not able to attend, and I do intend, I do, I do plan on, on live-streaming our, our Masses as soon as I can work out the logistics of it. It's very difficult to work out, um, you know, because we just don't have the funding, which is another reason I implore you all, please give to our 501c3. Uh, we really need the support right now more than ever so that we can continue to do more. Um, but in this particular gospel, the, the parable of the fig tree is very important. Why does Jesus use parables? Because these are he's talking about the ineffable realities of God, things that the human brain cannot comprehend if he were to try to come up with speech that could even hope to describe what he's talking about and there is none there are no words in the english language in the latin language in the greek language in the aramaic language or the hebrew languages none that can truly do justice to the realities of god so he uses metaphor we call them parables but they are metaphors they're little stories that help to convey a deep spiritual message just like who we are. We are metaphors amongst ourselves. Who are, what are our identities? Who are we? We're just made up of impressions of what we think, of the things that we do, our behaviors, and they get all messed up into some convoluted story. And voila, now we have Bishop Brian. We have everybody that exists in the world. We think we have identities. We think we have selves. We don't. They're just stories. They're just metaphors. So the parable speaks to us because it gives us an idea about the nature of hell. For those of you who think that hell is a place where you go to burn internally, no, that's Dante's Inferno. Okay? That's that's a, a lot of uh, Platonic thought. Plato gave you that idea. That's not the theology of the church. So dismiss it. Hell is not a place. Heaven's not a place. They're conditions. And we need to understand what kind of conditions they are. So what is the kingdom of heaven? Well, the kingdom of heaven is complete, absolute union with God, which is why we must be perfected. Remember theosis? God became man so that man can become God. Why do we receive the sacraments? Why do we receive the body and blood of Jesus in the form of the Eucharist? Why do we drink the blood of God and eat his flesh? so that we can be made like him, so that we can take some of his nature into ourself, and then it can change us if we allow it to. He never does anything without our permission. He wants our love, and love must be given freely, which is why free will is so important to him, even though it costs, us, it costs him greatly, because it is free will that corrupts the world. It's the choice to be ignorant that corrupts the universe. And he allows it because the only love that is worth having is one that is given freely. It cannot be coerced. 
It cannot be forced. It must be given through the volition of one's own desire. Okay? So, when we talk about the fig tree, this reflects what I have said in the past about the fires of Gehenna. Because let's talk about the nature of hell now. Hell is the state, the condition of being annihilated because one has been so thoroughly cut off from the Holy Spirit, the giver of life, that death is all that results. And it's a spiritual death. There is no eternity for those who cut themselves off from the divine life because the only thing that is immortal is God himself. And the only way to become immortal, to enjoy the fullness of eternal life that Jesus promises us through his death on the cross is to take that divine life into ourselves so that we too can become immortal. We are not immortal. Souls are not immortal. Throw that away. That's more platonic thinking. That's not the theology of the church. Even the church doesn't understand it anymore. It's ridiculous. But this is, this is the way it really is, my friends. You are not immortal. You must be made immortal. By taking the sacrifice of the cross into your own nature and being made holy through his death and resurrection. But for those who do not, who cut themselves off through the vehicle of sin or ignorance for our purposes today, must be annihilated. Not because it's punishment. Not because you're, oh, you're so awful, I want to get rid of you. That's not what God is doing here. It is the consequence of being cut off from the vitality of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will not force itself upon you. You must willingly receive it through love. There's no other way. And remember what Paul says about the gifts of the Holy Spirit for those of you charismatic people out there that are, you know, pushing the the, the prophecy and the speaking in tongues and the healing and all this stuff. What does St. Paul say that is the greatest gift of the Holy Spirit? It is love. All of those other ones are just, it's just, superfluous to love. It's all about the relationship. It's all about cultivating the relationship. That's what's important. That's what we must keep foremost in our mind, in our prayer life, in our liturgical life, in everything that we do, even in our careers, even in everything that we engage within the realm of the secular, requires that we must always, in the foremost of our mind, Maintain that love of God because that's how we pray without ceasing as another command of St. Paul's. In the parable of the fig tree, for three years I have come in search of fruit, but have found none. What is the fruit of the fig tree? We're not talking about figs. What is this fruit? What is he looking for? Is he looking for a good person? No, because we're not good people. Even Jesus said, why call me good? Only the Father in heaven deserves that that, that designation. It's not about being a good person. That's not the fruit of the fig tree. It's love. Or most importantly, compassion, which is higher than love, in a purer form and less conditional. In fact, I would say unconditional love is Compassion, they are synonymous with each other. Another big Buddhist word. Go figure that. Okay? So, those that are cut off from the gifts of the Holy Spirit, because if the Holy Spirit lives within them, then the greatest gift is already present, and that is love. We cut ourselves off from love, we cut ourselves off from the Holy Spirit, which is the giver of life. Death is the consequence. It exhausts the soil. It becomes a disease within the universe. And it must be torn down. Not out of cruelty to the tree, but out of necessity to the vitality of the soil and the other trees that are planted there who are thriving. Such is the kingdom of heaven. Such is the nature of hell. Hell is annihilation. The fires of Gehenna prove this. 
Gehenna was a trash dump, not a place of punishment, but a place to destroy what was no longer useful. There's other parables where Jesus makes this very clear. And it's unfortunate that this is considered esoteric because it really isn't. It's very conventional theology. I've shared nothing with you that is not consistent with the theology of the church. Now, it might not be what you're used to hearing because the church has modified its approach towards teaching it. We don't do that here. Not in the Holy Nicolaian Catholic Church. We have a higher purpose, a higher function. And this is not spiritual kindergarten. This is a place to cultivate a direct relationship with God that can only be achieved through love. The highest gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay. So culpability. Let's talk briefly about that before we close up. So culpability, like judgment, is not to be looked at as punishment. Now, that's what those words mean, okay? I mean, you know, when we think you're culpable, it means you're responsible for something, and now you must pay the penalty for your infraction. That's not the correct way to look at this, any more than, it, than anything else that we've discussed today. What is important, what must be constantly considered, repeatedly, is that as we fail to cultivate the relationship we are more willfully acting against the will of God and thus falling deeper into sin, which makes us more guilty of sin and thus cutting us off more to the life-giving vitality of the Holy Spirit. Death is the consequence. So think of culpability as how great of a consequence it is. If you are willfully cutting yourself off from that life-giving spirit, then you are inviting death and subsequent annihilation upon your demise from this world. Because it's very fleeting. Either we join with God or we fail to do so. If we've cut ourselves off from the Holy Spirit all entirely, then yes, that is most certainly death. And that is what you can expect. Not punishment, not eternal suffering in hell, but simply non-existence, annihilation. But eternal life in Christ is what is granted to those who he loves and whom he loves him. It's all about relationship, folks. It's all about love. Or better word is compassion. Okay? And we cultivate that fruit by sharing it with others. If you want love, then give love. You will not be permitted to keep anything that you do not give. God will not let you keep one thing that you are not willing to give first. We must be complete reflections of Christ on the cross. We must engage reckless abandonment in order to spiritually progress. That's just the way it is, as difficult as it sounds. That's the way to be made holy. It's the only way to be made pure enough to enter into the kingdom. To be fully realized So get rid of your notions of punishments, the judgment of God, the wrath of God. Dies irae. No. Let's focus rather on cultivating love amongst each other so that we may cultivate our love with, of God and thus be more aware of his return. He will give abundantly to those who give abundantly will take away from those who take away. That is the balance of the cosmos. 
And that's simply the way it is. I thank you all for listening to this broadcast. I'm not quite sure what subject we will cover next week. Um, I haven't really thought that far ahead. Like I said, I've been very ill. Um, not really very ill. I shouldn't say that. I should say my voice has been very ill. I've, I've just had laryngitis. And like I said, you could probably tell it's not perfectly normal. I'm still a little congested. I did have headaches. Uh, anytime my sinuses become inflared, my headaches go out, out of control. So, um, I haven't really had a chance to sit in my office and do my normal work. I'm a bit behind. And we also have several cases that we're working on uh, that are uh, involving potential demonic uh, attacks on people. And that's what we do. That's the primary outreach of this church is to assist people with spiritual problems. Uh, they have nowhere else to turn. Uh, in a lot of cases, they have sought help elsewhere and they have been rejected. Um, conventional uh, medical treatments are not working. Psychological treatments are not working. Psychiatric help is not working. And they have nowhere else to turn except to somebody who understands these things. And that's what this church does. And so we have a lot of those cases open, and like I said, I'm falling a little bit behind on my work because of, you know, anytime I get sick, it happens. I am the only clergy in my jurisdiction right now, um, but we, I, another thing I'd like to announce is that we are opening vocations to priesthood here in the Atlanta, Georgia area. So if you reside in Atlanta, Georgia, and would like to serve the people of the Holy Nicolaian Catholic Church and all of the people that appeal to us with uh, needs uh, of a spiritual nature, um, then I would love to hear from you. Uh, we do not have the, the, the same canons as, the, as Rome. So even though we are fully Catholic, we are not Roman Catholic. We are Nicolaian Catholic. And we um, allow for a married priesthood like the Orthodox churches do. So if you are married, you are welcome to apply to become a priest with us. And if you have some background in Catholicism, all the better, because then it, it will be easier for you to understand uh, the dynamics of our tradition. It's a very complex tradition, but it's a most beautiful, mystical one. And it, it's, it, it's, it's really not something... Uh, that uh, most people are 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 uh, terribly familiar with or prepared for until they see it and witness it, and then they can see how wonderful it is. God is with us, my friends. We feel Him every day within the chapel of the Holy Innocents here in uh, the Atlanta, Georgia area. And uh, if you would like to participate in our liturgical life, just give an email to office at nicolaian.org. Just go to esotericcatholic.org and you can see our website there and contact us with your request for more information. And if you want to be a priest with us, uh, all that you need to have is basically uh, you must be male. We, we do follow the traditional uh, uh, requirements for the Sacrament of Holy Orders. Uh, and you must uh, also uh, possess a bachelor's degree or at least be working on one. Uh, where there would be an expected uh, reception date for that, uh, where you would be granted your bachelor's degree. Uh, because we don't know how to have a, a complex seminary. It's more of a mentorship program. But there are classes that you must uh, take, and we teach those uh, directly to you. Um, and uh, it's, it's, uh, there is a process to it. But it's a, usually a lot quicker than it would be in the Roman Catholic Church, and we need your help. I need ministers that are willing to work with me on a regular basis to assist the, me, the, the people that come to us. And so uh, go to esotericcatholic.org or nicolaian.org. They're both the same website and read about what it's like to be a Nicolaian Catholic. Uh, and uh, I will be forever grateful uh, that you took the time to research us. Well, that is all for today, my friends. I want to thank you again for uh, joining me today. Uh, on this episode of Vestiges of Christianity. I will see you next week with a new episode. Uh, s remember to check us out on Facebook. Uh, we'll tell, uh, I'll, I'll be able to tell you what our subject matter will be next time. If you have any suggestions or input that you would like uh, to, me to talk about, also email me at office at nicolaian.org uh, or leave a message on, on Facebook, on our website, on, uh, sorry, our church page on Facebook. And uh, I'll be more than happy to uh, engage your question. Thanks again, everyone. This is Bishop Brian Willett saying God bless and take care. All my love. <laughs>